The Witch in the Wood by T.H. White Chapter 5 It was quiet in the Solar. From the open staircase door there came faintly an occasional magic laugh, but the staircase had to wind round the chapel before it came to the great hall, and that was where the laughing was being done. The queen and her guests were at dinner. In the quiet Solar you could just hear the sea five hundred feet below, but the main noise was the crackling of the fire. There was sea wreck burning in it, lively and salty and newly lit. The flames lit up the room, which was round like all the rooms in the great tower, and played upon two fine goshawks which stood unhooded on a long cage, on a long cage near the courtyard window. The mutes of these hawks were jetted outward over the new scented rushes on the floor, and they also shone bright and bold and white with a black spot in the center in vertical streaks over the wall behind them. All this made a fierce and barbaric pattern, for one of the hawks was an adult and the other in her first plumage, so that the slashes of the mutes seemed to emphasize the plumage of the birds. The young hawk had dark streaks upon her breast, bold thrush marks of feathers, and the old one was sedate in handsome horizontal bars. The shadow of their hooded beaks, of their hooked beaks, danced on the walls. There was only one chair in the Solar, a high-backed carved coffin of a chair which stood beside the fire. The rest of the seats were wooden chests, also carved with birds and beasts and cherubs, whose puffing cheeks took a highlight from the flames. On these chests and on the seat of a single chair, there were the usual folded carpet to make them comfortable. Over the fireplace, but badly lit now because the only light was the fire below it, the coat armor of King Lot was painted in a lavish splendor of goals and ore. It had been repainted. It had to be repainted once a year because the whole top half of the room was always black with smoke. One of the hawks was feeling pleased and sleepy. She lowered her left wing from her shoulder, slowly stretched her left leg under it, and remained for a moment taut. Then she repeated the performance on her right side, and began methodically pulling each of the primary feathers of each wing through her beak. When she had done this, she lifted both wings over her head, it was called warbling, and remained taut again, more or less in the position of one of those patient brass eagles who spend all their lives holding up Bibles for the Protestant clergy. After this, she resettled her wings and gave her tail a good shake, spreading it fanwise first, and smoothed each of the big tail feathers as she had done the pinions of the wings. Having finished her toilet, she gave herself a rattle all over, like a housemaid shaking, mop, shaking a mop out of a window, folded herself up like a well-folded umbrella, and went to sleep. Immediately she had to wake up again. There were steps on the narrow stairs outside the open door, and a light came in the front of, and a light came in front of the steps. It came around the arch of the door, some time after it had been shining on the wall outside, a small page came in carrying a very smoky torch and went round the walls putting fire to the guttering flambeau by which the room was lit. The new brightness which he had brought showed how black the ceiling was. The hawks followed him with their mad eyes until he had finished, and then the tinkling laugh sounded from nearer. The queen was coming. Queen Morgas was delighted. The arrival of two knights just when her stupid husband had taken Earl Olbaz to, to the battle was almost more than could be expected by her cleverest spells. King Pelinor looked very distinguished, if thin, and as for Grumor, well, he belonged to the true Jousten set anyway. She set to work as soon as she was in the room. And now, King Pelinor, she said, leading him to one of the carpet covered chests, if um, you must just sit down and tell me all about yourself every teeny-weeny bit. Oh, I say, replied the king, blinking in the firelight. Now you mustn't be shy with me. I'm only a poor, unprotected woman. Oh, no, surely not. What, what? In the corner of the hall below, where they had been left by themselves, Grumor and Palamidas sat down together and talked in low voices. Look here, Palamidas. It's about Pelinor. Big pardon. I'm worried about him. 
acquired old Palamides with all, a quaint old Palamides with all the facts. Pelinor was such a merry chap once. Not brainy, you know, but merry. He was quite happy chasing that beast of his until he fell in love. The tender passion. Yes, it is tender, isn't it? But the point is, what are we to do about it? He don't take any interest in things nowadays. But just sits about him. But just sits about writing poetry and weeping. Can't understand it myself. Self is also writing verses. Well, verses are difficult stuff to write. It has to rhyme, you know, and things like that. I can't stand much more of it. Some collaboration could be effected? Well, I don't know about collaboration. Matter of fact, I don't know what it means. But what I mean is, my dear fellow, why does he keep carrying on like this? Cupid, explained Sir Palamides. No doubt it is. Obliged by describing the object of affection. I don't quite follow you, old boy. Who is the woman? Well, as a matter of fact, she's the daughter of the Queen of Flanders. I only met her once myself, but she seemed a decent sort. It's not her I object to, but having to help him with this rhyming. <coughs> Excuse me. And he gets depression, too. Royal affection not returned. It don't seem to be. She don't answer these poems. Old Pelinor frequently is susceptible. Yes, said Sir Grummer. No, said Sir Grummer after a bit. Then I beg your pardon. But then I beg your pardon, said Sir Grummer. I'm afraid I don't quite follow your remark. Yours truly asked if Pelinor, if Pelinor often in love. Oh, no, you couldn't say that. No, no, Pelinor's a steady sort of chap. Of course there was the business with... <clears throat> of course there was the business with Ares the cowherd, added Sir Grummore reflectively. Explain such business. Pelinor fell in love with a milkmaid once. It was quite a touching affair, really. He used to hold the bucket for her. She was married to a man called Ares, so it wasn't very popular when they had a baby called Tor. Such conduct... Seems libidinous. Yes, it is rather, isn't it? But old Pelinor doesn't understand very much. It's his head, you know. All a fellow should understand facts of life, said Sir Palamides judiciously, putting the tips of his fingers together like Sherlock Holmes. He does partly, but it's a roving life, you know, like sailors, a wife in every port. Profoundly hope his majesty not actually bigamous. Oh, no, not bigamous, just a matter of speaking, you understand. As far as I know, he hasn't had any entanglements except this milkmaid and now the Flanders woman. But he's travelled about a bit after this beast. Palamides would respectfully suggest that Lovelorn Monarch should be re-interested in the same beast. Say that once again, will you? Can his majesty's attention be diverted to the questing beast? Oh, yes, I see. Well, the trouble is, we can't find the beast. And anyway, he doesn't seem to care about it any more. It's a proper mix-up, that is. And I can't tell you how sick I am of rhymes. Yours truly is in possession of a r of rhyming dictionary. We could use that. Delighted to render service, said Sir Palamides graciously. It's frightfully decent of you, Palamides, old boy, but what I mean is that doesn't cut it to the ro that doesn't cut to the root. We want something more drastic. Only Avenue seems beast. Yes, it does. Explore this avenue, quite. Turn all stones up so down. What? Palomides will bend mind to this question immediately. On their carpet seat, King Pelinor was under the magic. He was saying, oh no, please. Not at all, honestly, not. What? But you are, said the queen, romantic, that's what I say. A real he-man who but a he-man could go chasing after this skating beast all the time, here today and gone tomorrow. But it doesn't skate. The skating beast, said the queen, of course it skates. Otherwise, why should it be called so? And you skate after it year in and year out, a real romantic he-man. Oh, I say, said the king. I only wish my husband had a manly hobby like that. I do like manly men. Do you? Yes, I do. I always say that a womanly woman ought to have a manly man. It's just nature, isn't it? We are, we are all in the grip of nature. Yes, we are, aren't we? Nature, 
that great mother, red in tooth and claw. You must see a great deal of nature, King Pelinor, always skating about after the skating beast. Excuse me, Queen Morgoth, but the beast? Ah, the beast. I beg your pardon? The beast that is in every man. Beauty and the beast. Yes, of course. I believe you're really a big beast, King Pelinor, inside yourself. Just a big beast skating over the world in search of beauty. Oh, I say, Queen Morgoth. Yes, and when you find her, what do you do? I don't know, said the king. You pounce upon her. Pounce? Yes, pounce. Like that. Oh, I say no, honestly. Yes, you do. But I can't even skate. What has skating got to do with it? You said I was skating after this lady or whoever it was. You are pursuing the skating beast. But Queen Morgoth. Ah, you men, said the witch. You men, you men. You will never speak outright to us defenceless women. It is just part of the endless hunt. And that is the end of chapter five.